on an all-new Dr. Phil. It can dismantle a career that took a lifetime to build, and it can happen in a matter of minutes. Cancel culture. To completely reject and stop supporting someone because they have said or done something that offends you. What is liberal about canceling everybody and anything that you don't happen to agree with? It's a complete nonsense. It's not just the rich and famous who are fair game. 50 students that I had never met showed up, accused me of racism, and demanded that I either resign or be fired. He was forced to quit a job he loved, branded a racist, and hunted by an angry mob of protesters, all for speaking up for what he believed was right. The protesters filmed our interaction, and it went viral. With all of these students outside your classroom threatening violence, they're searching for you in cars on campus. What are they going to do if they find you? Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Today I'm talking about a worrying new trend whereby merely voicing an opinion in public can result in you losing everything. What I'm talking about? Cancel culture. Here's what it means. A way of behaving in society or group, especially on social media, in which it is common to completely reject and stop supporting someone because they have said or done something that offends you. The internet also sets its sights on politicians, business leaders, athletes, writers, academics, you name it. Make no mistake, anyone can be canceled at any moment for anything, including the average American. Let's take a look at cancel culture in action. This woke thing is out of control. There's a self-righteousness to it where liberals have become completely intolerant. They want us all to lead their lives. And if you don't, you have to be shamed, abused, cancelled, and so on. Uh, hashtag reading R.I.P. J.K. Rowling has been trending. Harry Potter author has not died. is the latest victim of cancel culture. Her uh, new book. It is said to feature a male serial killer who dresses in women's clothing. It's divided opinion and, of course, caused a storm online. If I was to write a novel and the killer looks like me, that's fine. But if I was to actually make the killer a transgender killer, that is unacceptable and I would have to be shamed, vilified and cancelled. The old joke about, you know what, ice cream vans will be next. Guess what? No. Ice cream vans are next. Ice cream vans are going to be banned from many streets in the country. When will the world change, in your view, enough to be allowed to play baby it's cold outside again? Well, I'd like a real drop in sexual assault statistics. This isn't sexism. This is flirtation. It's a wonderful song that everyone's enjoyed and should continue to enjoy. What Radical feminists like you want to suck the yeah. joy but it's out a of good everything. Well, joining me for the second day in a row is a man who many have tried to cancel, but no one has climbed that hill yet. Joining me from London via Zoom is my good friend Piers Morgan, editor-at-large of DailyMail.com, host of Good Morning Britain, and the author of the new book, Wake Up. Now, Piers is a good friend of mine. We work together some on Daily Mail TV, so in full disclosure... I just want everybody to know that besides the fact that I love DailyMail.com, I'm also one of the executive producers of the Emmy-winning show Daily Mail TV that's now in its fourth season, and you often see Piers popping up there. So, Piers, how are you? I'm great, thank you, Dr. Phil. Well, I have to tell you, I absolutely love, love, love your new book. And I, I wanted to get into the part of it today that talks about cancel culture. And you say cancel culture, as it's become known, is one of the very worst things about modern society, and it's driven by the same woke liberals who profess to stand for tolerance. That's from page 60. This is a very vocal minority that's really kind of a bunch of bullies. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And I say that as somebody who skews more liberal than, than to the right. Uh, I can't believe how my fellow liberals are behaving. What is liberal 
about cancelling everybody and anything that you don't happen to agree with. It's a complete nonsense. Now, I'm a very opinionated person, as you know, Dr. Phil. I write very opinionated columns. I just want to reserve the right under freedom of speech and the First Amendment to give an opinion. And this really insidious new culture means that almost anyone who is offended by anything can get on social media and say, hey, I'm offended. Cancel that person. Cancel that thing. And within seconds, minutes, hours, this enormous eruption builds on social media, driving other people to share this zealous lust to cancel people. And the one that really, I think, exemplified this perfectly was J.K. Rowling, who, you know, they tried to cancel. She's a billionaire author. You can't cancel a billionaire author. She'll keep writing books. But what was really bad about that, I felt, was the way that her right to have an opinion about this raging gender debate was not just silenced by the woke brigade, but they actually began a hashtag, R.I.P. J.K. Rowling. They wanted her dead because she had an opinion they didn't agree with. Well, what percentage of the population is on Twitter? So it's about 20% in the U.S. and the U.K., and of the 20% that are on it, only 10% make 80% of the Twitter noise. Most people don't agree with cancel culture. The vast majority want cancel culture cancelled. But here's the thing that bothers me. Mainstream media, yep. uh, pop culture media, all picks that up off of Twitter and takes it mainstream and gives those people the platform to spread this throughout society and empowers them to have influence way beyond what they actually have as a platform. And so they're complicit in giving this cancel culture a much bigger platform than they actually have. And that's what really bothers me. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not just the rich and famous who are fair game when it comes to cancel culture. My next guest says he was stalked by an angry mob and lost his livelihood over a single email. We're going to dive into that story with Piers' help next. This example of cancel culture has been widely circulated. The fact is this turned our lives upside down. Sooner or later, it comes for everyone. The story that was being told about me in the end won, even though it wasn't true. And later... She just wants anyone that doesn't sign up to her woke view to be eliminated. I don't think that there's any reason why she shouldn't have been canceled. It's a new, very ugly phenomenon that can dismantle a career that took a lifetime to build, and it can happen in a matter of minutes. I'm talking about cancel culture. My next guest that we're going to add to the conversation says he was forced to quit a job he loved, branded a racist, and hunted by an angry mob of protesters, all for speaking up for what he believed was right. In May of 2017, I became public enemy number one at a college where I had been a very popular professor for 14 years. The bearded man with his hands on his head is Brett Weinstein, a biology professor at the college. He criticized an effort to have white students and staff stay away from campus for a day. For that, he says he was labeled a racist. There was a long-standing tradition at Evergreen called Day of Absence in which faculty, staff, and students of color did not come to campus for one day to emphasize the importance of the role that they were playing there. In 2017, white people were asked not to come to campus. This did not sit well with me. I wrote a letter saying that this was an unacceptable policy and that I intended to show up on campus. Despite having been a liberal for my whole life, I was told that I was a racist. On May 23rd, 50 students that I had never met showed up disrupted my class, accused me of racism, and demanded that I either resign or be fired. The protesters filmed our interaction, and it went viral. 
As news of the protests spread across the country, counter demonstrations came to campus, and police arrested a New Jersey man after they say he phoned in a threat to kill people on campus. On the second day of the protest, the chief of police called me. She told me not to come to campus because the police could not protect me there. The administrators sided with the protesters, even though they knew full well there was no evidence of racism. The administration couldn't fire me because I was tenured and because it was a public college and I had the right to free speech. My wife was literally the college's most popular professor, and I was very well liked, but ultimately we were forced to leave. There was just simply no way to continue in that environment. This example of cancel culture has been widely circulated. The fact is, this turned our lives upside down. This phenomenon is spreading. Sooner or later, it comes for everyone. And when it does, you'll find yourself in a hall of mirrors. You won't know what's what. I am not a racist. Everything about the life I have led would tell you that. But the fact is, it didn't matter. It was not enough to save my job. The story that was being told about me, in the end, won, even though it wasn't true. Well, please welcome virtually from Oregon, Dr. Brett Weinstein. Doctor, thank you for joining us today. And thanks for having me. Now, this is a, a sad and tragic example of what Pierce describes in his book, Wake Up. And the thing I, I guess that bothers me the most about it is people weren't really interested in what you truly believed or what you truly stood for, but instead finding an example that they could use to springboard into a, a cause. Were, were you used in that way? Yes, and I think that's maybe the most important thing about the event that took place is that there was, they needed a villain. And they didn't think very carefully about who they targeted and how well that story was going to play. They just needed someone to, to play the part of a racist. And by choosing me, it created uh, an ability to see essentially behind the curtain. Um, my students knew that I wasn't a racist. Most of my faculty colleagues did as well. And so the fact that I was pursued as if I had said something egregious allowed the world in some sense to see that this isn't about guilt at all. It's about power. But, Piers, this is the mob mentality that you're describing in the cancel culture, right? It's an absolutely classic, and if I may say so, utterly disgraceful example of cancel culture. We need to cancel this insidious cancel culture. Doctor, wh what happened once you you did depart the university, you, you ultimately made a settlement with them, but what, what are you doing now? Well, I was lucky that uh, my skill set allowed me to move into uh, uh, an alternative career that frankly I just didn't, I didn't pick. So I'm now podcasting, uh, I'm writing, and I'm uh, well, before COVID, I was being flown around the world to speak to audiences about this phenomenon and others. So, in a sense, I'm taking my training in evolutionary biology and deploying it by non-standard means for a professor. But most people don't have an alternative way to take whatever they've trained for exactly. and bring it to the world. And so, this is really... In some sense, I worry about the term cancel culture because it sounds like you're being ridiculed and it's very unpleasant. But this is really about livelihoods and ending them without any sort of due process. Now, that's, that's the whole issue. Now, Dr. Weinstein has a question for me, and I'll answer that when we come back. <laughs> Pierce, what has this come to? It's shocking, isn't it? I mean, we cannot believe we're even discussing this. I'm here with journalist uh, Piers Morgan talking about cancel culture, which he covers in his book, Wake Up. Dr. Brett Weinstein has been canceled and has a question for me. Doctor, what is it? Well, when I was first challenged by this mob, I was not initially terribly concerned because I knew that what they were accusing me of just simply wasn't true. And so these were college students that I had not met, and I 
felt like my job was to help college students see things that they couldn't see. And so I tried to do that. And what I discovered was that I could reach individuals. It happened many times during the protest, but each time that it happened, that person would be pulled back by the mob and effectively re-educated. So my question is, is there some mechanism to reason with a mob in the way one reasons with a person? Trying to talk to a mob about changing their mind is like trying to talk to a drunk about their drinking while they're drunk. It just doesn't happen because the mob mentality suffers from what is called confirmation bias. They've made their mind up and they set their filter so the only information they process is that which confirms their belief. And in fact, research tells us that if you bring them evidence contrary to their belief, it only deepens their bias. I, I saw you with all of these students outside your classroom threatening violence. They're searching for you in cars on campus. What are they going to do if they find you? Well, this is maybe the thing that worries me most, is I, I'm not even sure that they know what they were going to do. I think they had the idea that I needed to have my mind changed by force if necessary. So what was going to happen if they found me and insisted that I recant or admit racism that I didn't possess? And I said no. And I worry that it could have ended very, very badly. Pierce, what has this come to? We have college students that supposedly are, are, are going to a university to learn, to open their minds, and someone has disagreed with a policy. They're searching cars to drag him out of. Does this make sense? It's shocking, isn't it? I mean, we cannot believe we're even discussing this. You go to university to learn, to evolve, to be taught new ideas, to have your own ideas challenged. And here you have an eminent professor who simply asked a question, simply challenged an idea. And by, by exercising his right as a university professor to do what his job is, he gets destroyed and threatened in such a menacing, horrible, ugly manner. And my message to those students is, grow up. Well, and I wonder about the mentality on some of the college campuses, and I want to talk about that when we come back. And we're going to meet a woman who says cancel culture is a good thing because it's forcing people to think before they speak. We'll add her to the conversation after the break. I'm a married mother of two, and I consider myself to be as woke as one can be, I support cancel culture. I truly believe that if somebody offends or harms marginalized groups, they deserve to be canceled. I used to think of Piers Morgan as intelligent, but knowing what I know now about Piers Morgan is his support of Donald Trump, I'm pretty much anti-Piers Morgan. We are living in times of civil unrest, times where it seems like it's simply not enough to just disagree with an issue or opinion without taking action to implement change by protesting. And I think people's right to protest is very, very important. I think we have the right to protest. I think people should exercise their right to protest. But the goal of that protest is what I think is, is being questioned at times. Now, my next guest, Gina, is a married mother of two children who says it's her goal to raise woke children and believes sometimes cancel culture is the only way to bring bigoted people to justice. I'm a married mother of two, and I consider myself to be as woke as one can be. Being woke is being awakened to the fact that different groups in this country go through life with very different sets of rules. I'm raising my children to be very educated and accepting of people of different colors, genders, and be woke. I support cancel culture because I feel for far too long people that have been racist, homophobic, and 
really victimized, marginalized groups have gotten away with it for far too long. And I find that this is a way that we can take our power back and expose these people for who they really are. I truly believe that if somebody behaves in a way that offends or harms marginalized groups, that they deserve to suffer the consequences and be canceled. An example of a non-celebrity that I believe deserved to be canceled is Amy Cooper, who called the police on Christian Cooper, a black man who was in Central Park bird watching. And I do not have one bit of sympathy for the fact that that woman lost her job and her career and likely many of her friends. Michael Richards spewed the n-word at a comedy show was not a joke was not kidding he said it aggressively and angrily and we haven't heard from him since so it's not like he came out after that and you know apologized another positive thing about cancel culture is i think that it has forced people to think before they speak and kim kardashian did really what we would expect of kim kardashian i mean nobody's looking to the kardashians to be their moral compass as a liberal i find that it is hard to continue to try to fight for what I believe is right. I used to think of Piers Morgan as an intelligent, interesting celebrity. But knowing what I know now about Piers Morgan is his support of Donald Trump. I am anti everything he stands for, therefore I'm pretty much anti Piers Morgan. All right, Piers, did you hear that? <laughs> oh, I heard it. I'm friendly with Donald Trump. But nobody's been more critical of him this year than me. And throughout his presidency, I've criticized him when I think he deserves it. And I've supported him on issues that I think he's been right about. Now, I think that is what being a liberal is about. But it seems to me, with great respect to my best noir here, that she just wants anyone that doesn't sign up to her woke view to be eliminated, gone, trash. Even if, like me, you're not remotely racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, or bigoted in any way. She said because he is friends with him, now you don't like him. It's not that I don't like Mr. Morgan. I actually um, have always had a, a respect for him in the sense that I think he calls it like he sees it. I think that he's a very formidable person to debate, and he can hold his own. I have a problem, though, in the sense that I think that there are certain people that can speak to Donald Trump, and it sounds like you're one of them. And I think that there does need to be a dialogue. But I will say for myself that I believe Donald Trump to be a racist and a homophobe and a sexist. It's very hard for me to support or understand that. Now, that being said, I do think that there are certain people that can get through to him, and I think that's something very, very admirable about Mr. Morgan. Do you ever worry that you judge someone that you don't really know their true feelings and that people can pick an isolated event to ratchet up their cause and get a lot of ink. Do you ever worry that you're getting hoodwinked by this woke culture that is using something out of context to further their cause? Absolutely. When I support cancel culture, I'm talking about Amy Cooper, who lied to the police and tried to get a black man arrested. I don't think that there's any reason why she shouldn't have been canceled. Now, but you see the doctor here, he's a tenured professor, and calls something into question, and his career is just, he's drummed out of the university. I don't agree with what happened to him. I think that you left out a critical component of that, and that is the administration. I don't understand why the administration didn't try to collectively support the professor and the students and try to create a dialogue. At what point does exercising your civic right to protest turn into something darker and more sinister? And should you be canceled for how you protest others? Now, my next guest has a lot to say about this predicament. We're going to add them to the conversation when we come back. I can tell you that Antifa is an ideology. When they say make America great again, that's supposed to be without us. We have a rule that uh, wherever they go, we go. And you can bet the people that they really, really hate are the ones that you're going to want to be on the side of.
I'm joined today by editor-at-large for DailyMail.com, Piers Morgan, whose new book, Wake Up, explores, among other things, the idea of cancel culture. Now, my next guest, Daryl, is an activist who says he supports cancel culture fully. My name is Daryl Lamont Jenkins. I am the executive director and founder of One People's Project, an anti-hate organization based in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Cancel culture is a great thing because it is the epitome of expression in today's society. Because it goes beyond just speaking. And now it's an action. What's going on in America right now is course correction. We are supposed to be a free country about liberty and justice for all. Folks in the streets, they're frustrated. So I'm going to tell you just flat out. If you think that what they are doing is wrong, you go out there and do what's right. I can tell you that Antifa is an ideology, is a belief. Just like conservatism is a belief or fascism is a belief. Donald Trump was elected because they had a candidate on the other side. Those who try to make it otherwise are trying to basically avoid being called thought police. And they've done it before. They do it to Black Lives Matter, calling it an organization or a terrorist organization. When they say make America great again, that's supposed to be without us. We're not supposed to come along with what makes America great. They're wrong. We have a rule that uh, wherever they go, we go. And you can bet the people that they really, really hate are the ones that you're going to want to be on the side of. Well, joining me virtually is Daryl. Daryl, thank you so much for being here. Hey, good morning. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing all right. Now, tell me what your uh, agenda is and, and what your organization or movement, whichever way you choose to refer to it, uh, is all about. What's at the top of your agenda? We are just simply looking at providing information for people to try to get an understanding of what's been going on over not just the summer, but also the past four years and maybe the past few decades. I think folks are frustrated. When I say it's a course correction, it's simply because we should have never been in this position. And you say that Antifa is not about violence. It just deals with people that are damaging to the United States. Well, let me know. Antifa has gotten themselves into some brawls, to underscore a fact. I'm not going to deny that. But I think you can find people who are particularly focused on trying to just find solutions beyond or rather, I should say, before we get into that situation. Martin Luther King was an anti-fascist. Right. The original, the original cancer culturists, the folks who started the Montgomery bus boycott, they were Antifa. And Pierce, do you have a question for Daryl? Well, only that you, you referenced Martin Luther King there, who was arguably the most famous and brilliant protester of the last hundred years. And yet he always said violence begets violence. He always said protesting should be conducted peacefully. And to have a lot of, you know, very laudable uh, aims. And I'm sure I would agree with lots of what Daryl believes. But th the problem with cancel culture is where Antifa, when they take their protest and get violent, they lose me. You have to recognize where it all comes from, where all that frustration comes from. It is not all burning down the streets. It's not all beating up people and taking down monuments and things like this. It's about finding real solutions. I think that there are different facets to this fight. If that's not the facet you're comfortable with, check out the other facets. Because even I'm Martin Luther King... Darryl. Okay. Huh? I'm only uncomfortable. Understood. I'm uncomfortable as Martin Luther King as Martin Luther King was. I'm uncomfortable yes. when the protesting becomes violent because that, to me, is the wrong way to get what you want. Can I add something? That first of all, the protest over the bridge in Selma was referred to as Bloody Sunday. So this whitewashed idea that Martin Luther King only had peaceful protests is a joke. The it wasn't Martin protest. Luther King who brought the violence no, to that the bridge. Police. I gotta disagree with you there. But, what the but, hell are you talking about? It's the police 
But I do have to make a point. Well, no, it wasn't bloody because of Martin Luther King and his protesters. They were on the receiving end of that violence. Agreed, but Martin Luther King had gone to LBJ prior to that, and he said that he could not go and fight any harder for equal rights with different races. And they said, we're going to get you something to go to Congress with. That is absolutely a fact. You know, Martin Luther King was referred to as a rabbi-riser in those days. Right. They accused him of, of instigating that violence. So even if, even if they were being peaceful, it didn't matter to the greater society that despised them. Well, and we you have, see it now. We have peaceful protests with Colin Kaepernick, and there's a man who's yes. getting canceled. Yes. Next, I'll be answering questions from my virtual audience. No topic is off limits. We'll be right back. Hey everyone, season 19 is underway. If you never made it to Hollywood to be a part of the studio audience, well, now it doesn't matter. If you're in Oklahoma, Georgia, Texas, New Jersey, or anywhere else in the world, now you can be a part of our virtual audience. Go to drphil.com and click on Be Part of the Audience for more information. We've got just enough time to hear some questions from the studio audience in a segment called No Appointment Necessary. We'll start with Sonny from Mississippi. And Sonny, what's your question? Hi, Dr. Phil. I'm a journalism educator. I also teach public speaking to young people. I empower them so that they know their voice matters. But with the plethora of good and bad examples on social media of cancel culture, what advice can you share with me so I can share it with them of how they can ask questions so that they don't just jump on the cancel culture bandwagon and it becomes a platform for cyber bullying? Well, you know, Sonny, I, I would hope that we would really implore our students today to not be sheep, uh, to not be part of the mob, because the mob mentality uh, jumps they're very kind of ADD and looks at headlines and is not real big on fact-checking. I have seen people's lives destroyed by misinformation, half facts, and people just not doing their homework like a real journalist should. So you're in the right position to teach them to be critical thinkers. So thank you for the question. Benjamin from Illinois. One of the reasons why I love your program is you do such a great job of making sure that each guest gets to tell his or her side of the story. So my question to you is this. Have you ever considered being a moderator for our political debates? And I hope that you do. <laughs> and I think everyone in the audience agrees with me. You know, I, I think it's something that I might consider someday, but... My attitude is that if you take more than two sentences to ask a question, then your question wasn't ready. And I, I've watched moderators who I think become part of the debate, and that's not what this is supposed to be about. I think moderators are there to do just that. They're traffic cops. I think that people need to do their homework before they do anything, and I, when I'm here, uh, I feel like on my show, if a guest comes on here and is willing to be a teaching tool to create teachable moments, moral moments uh, in America, uh, I owe it to them to do my homework, to know what the situation and the circumstances are. And I would hope that everybody does that, whether they're moderating a debate, participating in a debate, or whatever. So if I do wind up in that situation, you can bet I'll do my homework before I get there. I promise I'll know what's going on. Um, when we come back, I'm going to talk about whether or not colleges are doing what they need to do with their students to prepare them for the next level of life or not. Right after the break, I'll give you my opinion. We'll be right back. You know, I look at what's happening on university campuses today, and I have to tell you that it really concerns me. Uh, ben Shapiro is a conservative. He talks a lot about things that are happening on the right. Uh, he went to speak at uh, Berkeley uh, not 
too long ago. I think it's been a year and a half, maybe two years. And they had to bring on $600,000 of additional security just to get him on and off what is generally thought to be a very liberal campus. Now, I am really concerned uh, when our campuses where we're supposed to go and be looking at ideas all across the board have become so close-minded that you have to bring on $600,000 of security to get a speaker on that might differ from the general ideology of the student body? What's going on? Cornell University hosted a cry-in complete with hot chocolate and tissues for disappointed Hillary Clinton supporters because they were afraid they were going to be upset at the outcome of the last presidential election. University of Pennsylvania brought in a puppy and a kitten for therapeutic cuddling sessions for students that were too upset by the outcome of the elections. That university is not preparing you, not toughening you up for what's happening in the real world. And I don't know, I, maybe it's just me, but if something happened in my life when I was in school, I don't remember them bringing in puppies and kittens to make me feel better about it. <laughs> Piers, what do you think? I couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Phil. I think uh, the stories you've just read out are shameful, they're embarrassing, they're cringe-making. I blame participation prizes at school for the start of all this, when if you come last now in a sporting event, you get a prize. How does that possibly prepare any of these students for the real world? Stop giving participation prizes and start encouraging them to listen to speakers they don't agree with. And then they may actually learn something. I always thought America was a meritocracy where you worked hard and you got ahead and that, that it, what we needed to do was make sure that everybody had a fair chance, and that hadn't happened historically, and to me, that's what we need to work on. Uh, I want to thank all of my guests today. A special thanks to DailyMail.com editor-at-large and host of Good Morning Britain, Piers Morgan, whose latest book, Wake Thanks, Up, uh, is available now. For more information about today's show, log on to drphil.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to my wife Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret. She doesn't keep any secrets at all. They figure out what the secrets are to uh, having a wonderful, fulfilling, and exciting life, and they share them with all of you. And she talks to some of the most interesting men and women in the world. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Yeah.